following reading is from William Bridges, A Lifting Up of the Downcast, Chapter 9, A Lifting Up in Case of Spiritual Desertion. Why art thou cast down, my soul, and why art thou disquieted within me? Sometimes the discouragements of the saints are taken from their desertions, spiritual desertions. And this is David's case here. For he says in verse 10, As a sword in my bones, mine enemies reproach me. Well, they say unto me, Where is your God? In verse 9, I will say to God, My God, why have you forgotten me? And this is the ordinary case of God's children. Oh, says one, The Lord has forgotten me, hid his face from me, and has forsaken my soul, and therefore I am thus discouraged. I do not complain for lack or loss of outward mercies and blessings. Yea, though all the world should forsake me, I should not be much afflicted, if God and Christ were present with me. But times were when the candle of the Lord shined upon me, when I walked as I thought in the light of his countenance, but now the Lord has hid his face from me, and has left and forsaken my soul. Have I not just cause and reason to be cast down now, and to be much disquieted? No, I grant, and it must needs be granted, that it is the most sad thing for a gracious heart to lack the face and presence of God and Christ, to be deserted and forsaken by Christ. Yea, and I do not know anything or any affliction that is so afflictive to a gracious heart as this, for take any other affliction. And though it be great, yet it is but a particular affliction. The loss of some particular good, and the putting out of some one candle, or the hiding of some one star. But if Christ hide his face, and God withdraw or hide himself, it is the darkening of the sun, which brings an universal darkness upon the soul, and it embitters all other afflictions. For as the presence of Christ sweetens all other comforts, so the absence or forsakings of Christ do embitter all our other sufferings, and cut off all our relief and remedy against them. So long as the face of God shines upon a poor soul, he may run to Christ, and relieve and help himself against his affliction. True, my friends, forsake me. My relations forsake me. But Christ has not forsaken me. But if God and Christ forsake, where shall a man relieve or refresh himself in this stormy day? And as those sins are greatest that cut off our relief against other sins, so those afflictions are greatest that cut off our relief against other afflictions, such as this, of all afflictions. It looks the most like a judgment to a gracious soul. O Lord, says David, don't correct me in your anger, nor chasten me in your hot displeasure. Psalm 6, verse 1. When God hides his face and forsakes the soul, he seems to correct in anger and in hot displeasure. Herein a Christian does, as it were, combat with God himself. He fights with men sometimes, and then he is more than a conqueror, because Christ fights with him and in him. He fights with Satan, principalities and powers, and then he overcomes, because Christ is with him. But, oh, says the soul, in this desertion, God is mine enemy here. I must fight it out hand to hand with divine anger. And what shall I do now? How is it possible that I should now escape? The truth is, this affliction above all others seems to draw a curtain over all our comforts and to put an end to all our spiritual joy. What birds sing in the winter time? Some may, but ordinarily they don't. If you walk abroad in the winter time and hear no birds sing, and one say to you, What is the reason of this deep silence? Two or three months ago, when we walked in the fields, every wood had its several music. How sweetly did the birds sing then? But now they are all silent. What is the reason? You will easily answer, I, then indeed it was summer time. Then the sun shone upon them, and so they sang. But now the warming and enlivening beams of the sun are gone. They sing no more. Beloved, the light of God's countenance is our spring. Desertion is our winter. Show me that saint that is able to sing in this winter time. I confess it is possible for a man to do it, and some there are. Habakkuk was one that learned this song of faith. 
but how few are able to sing and rejoice when God hides himself. No, says the soul, two or three months ago the Lord shined upon me. And then I could sing indeed, but now God and Christ are gone. And so all my songs are gone and joys are gone, and I fear I shall never see them again, or rejoice in Christ again. It is said of Mary that when she went to Christ's sepulchre, she wept. And though the angel came to her and said, Why are you weeping? Yet she continued weeping. The presence of an angel could not comfort her. Why? Oh, she says, They have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. Would it not grieve a prince to be dispossessed of and to lose his crown? To be made like an ordinary man? This presence of Christ is the crown of a Christian. And therefore, when God has forsaken the church, as we read in Lamentations, she complained in verse 16, The crown has fallen from my head. Why? Verse 20. Wherefore do you forget us forever and forsake us for so long a time? Verse 22. You have utterly rejected us. You are very wroth against us. Take away the presence of Christ, and you set a Christian among the ordinary rank of men, and must do not needs be troubled when his crown is thus taken from his head? I have read of a religious woman that, having borne nine children, professed that she had rather endure all the pains of those nine travails at once than endure the misery of the loss of God's presence. And indeed this affliction of God's forsaken a man is so great, that if a man doesn't feel it, I even fear it is because he is forsaken indeed. But now, though there be never so much gall and wormwood in this cup, yet the children of God have no reason to faint at the drinking of it, no just cause or reason yet to faint or be discouraged or cast down. How may that appear? For the clearing of this truth to you, you must know that God or Christ is said to forsake a man either in regard of his power, grace, or strength, or in regard of the comfortable feelings of his love, either in regard of union or in regard of vision. Number one, in regard of union, he never forsakes his own people. Number two, in regard of his power, grace, and strength, he never forsakes him totally. And number three, in regard of vision or comfortable feelings, though he does forsake for a time, yet he will return again. And if all these be true, have they any reason to be much discouraged? For the first, you know what is said in John 13, verse 1, Those whom he loves, and loves unto the end. As for the second, you know what he says also in Hebrews 13, 5, I will never leave you, nor forsake you. We are kept by the power of God unto salvation, 1 Peter 1, 5. And as for the third, has not the Lord promised in Isaiah, 54, that he will return again with advantage, verse 7. For a small moment have I forsaken you, but with great mercy will I gather you, in a little wrath I hid my face from you, for a moment. But with everlasting kindness will I have mercy on you, says the Lord your Redeemer, verse 8. Now you know that friends are not much troubled at such a parting, which is but for a time. It is said of the church of Ephesus, that when Paul took leave of them, they wept, because he said they should see his face no more. The saints cannot say so in regard of Christ, though they see not his face for the present, yet they cannot say, I shall see his face no more, for he will return again, yea, and return with advantage. For though he forsakes for a moment, yet with great mercy and with everlasting kindness will the Lord have mercy on them. What then? Though you are forsaken for a moment, have you any just cause and reason for your discouragement? Number two. If Christ do therefore forsake his people, that he may not forsake them, and has the design of love and nothing but of love upon him in his forsaking, then they have no just cause for their discouragement. Now I pray, what is the reason why God forsakes his people for a time or a moment? Has he only designed but love upon them? Does he not therefore withdraw himself from them, that he might draw them to himself? 
Does he not therefore hide his face for a moment, that he may not turn his back upon them forever? Does he not therefore forsake them for a moment, that they might die to all the world, and long after heaven where there is no forsaking? Does he not therefore forsake them for a moment, that they might die unto the way of sense, and to learn to live by faith, which is a proper work of this life? Does he not therefore forsake them for a moment, that in this winter of their desertion the weeds and vermin of their sins may be killed and mortified? Does he not therefore forsake them for a moment that he may see their love to him? In time of his presence we have the sense of his love to us, but in the time of his absence then he sees and we ourselves have the sense of our love to him. Does he not therefore forsake them for a moment that their very joys and comforts may be more fervent? exalted and enlarged? It is our nature to rejoice most in a comfort when it is redeemed from the hand of death and recovered from loss. The wise men, when they saw the lost star again, then they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. Did they not rejoice in the star before? Surely they did, but they rejoiced more even with exceeding great joy when they had found the lost star. And this is our nature. We rejoice most in the finding of lost mercies. Now the Lord Christ knows our nature, and therefore that he may raise our joy, our praise, our thankfulness for his presence, face, and manifestation of his love. Sometimes he withdraws from us, so that in all his withdrawings he has a design of love upon our souls. Have we any reason, then, to be much discouraged, though deserted? Number three. Though it pleases God to hide his face from his people sometimes, insomuch as they are in the dark, and in a very dark condition, yet they are never so much in the dark, but that they have light enough to work by. For what day is there in all the year that is so short, dark, and gloomy, but a man may see to work by? Indeed, sometimes the sun is in the eclipse, sometimes behind a cloud, sometimes it breaks not forth with its golden beams as at other times. But if the sun be up and it be day, a man has always light enough to work by. Now the sun is always up with the saints, it is always day with them. Though the beams of the sun of righteousness do not shine, yet it is always day. They are not children of darkness, they may have a dark day of it, but though it never be so dark, they may find light enough to do the great work which they came into the world for, which is to believe and trust and stay themselves on God. This a man may do in the darkest time, when he has no light, and therefore, the prophet says, let him that walks in darkness and sees no light, stay himself upon the name of the Lord. What then, though you have not so much light as you would have, to refresh yourselves by, Yet if you have light enough to do your father's work by, and the greatest work of this life is to trust in God and believe, have you then any reason for your discouragements? Thus it is with all the saints. Though they may be in the dark, and the sun shines not out upon them, yet it is always day with them. And they have light enough when it is darkest to do their father's work and business by, and therefore certainly the saints have no reason to be cast down and discouraged, although they be much forsaken, deserted, and in the dark. But Jesus Christ has not only deserted, forsaken, and withdrawn himself from me in regard of vision, but I fear also in regard of union, not in regard of comfortable feelings only, but in regard of strength and power, and therefore I am afraid and discouraged, and have I not cause for it? No, for a man that is in the dark is not able to judge of his own grace or Christ's strength in him. Now you are in desertion, therefore in the dark, therefore you are not able to judge of your own grace and Christ's strength in you. Yet if you can judge in this condition, and will deal faithfully with your own souls, is there not as much of Christ's strength and grace in your lives and conversations as when you had that presence which you mourn after, except in your enlargement and duties? 
I confess indeed that a gracious man in time of desertion has not those enlargements as he had when God's face shined upon him. But setting aside your enlargements, what is there in your conversations lacking now which you had then? And is the very want of enlargement a sufficient reason to say that Christ is gone has forsaken me? not only in regard of vision, but in regard of union, strength, and grace. We read in Canticles 5, verse 5, that when Christ withdraws from the spouse, there is some myrrh left upon the wrinkles of the door. The spouse arises, follows after him, and inquires for him, saying, Did you see my beloved? She met with a watchman. They smote her, and she was willing to bear their smiting, that she might hear of Christ. She stands and admires at the beauty and excellency of her beloved. White and ruddy, the fairest of ten thousand. Now in this desertion of yours, is there not some err upon the wrinkles of your heart? Do you not still stand admiring Christ and his excellencies? Do you not inquire after your beloved, going to one and to another, saying, did you see him whom my soul loves? Are you not willing that the watchman should smite you so you may but meet with Christ again? And will you say then, he is not only gone in regard of vision, but in regard of union, power, strength, and grace too? Surely have no reason for that. But I am not only forsaken and deserted, and lack the comfortable feelings and manifestations of love which I once had and do now desire to have, but I do find the contrary tokens of God's displeasure, manifestations of his anger. Were it only the withdrawings of love, I might bear it. But Christ is angry with me. God is angry. He appears to be my enemy. And have I not reason now to be much discouraged? No. For if this has been the condition of the saints before you, why should you fear your state in this respect? Look into Isaiah 57, and you shall find that God says, I was wroth and smote him. He did not only hide his face, but he was wroth. Yea, he is not only wroth, but he smote his people too. And yet the promise is, I will restore comfort to him and to his mourners. Did not Job think and say that God was angry with him and become his enemy? And did not Job's friend think that God loved them and was their friend and his enemy? Yet if you look into Job 42, you find that God was more pleased with Job, for he was fain to pray for them before they could be accepted. And know you not that it is Christ's usual manner to personate an enemy when he intends the most friendship, to seem a stranger when he intends the most communion? It is said that God was angry with Moses, Exodus 4. Yet even then he gave him such a promise of mercy as he had never had before, verse 14, 15, and 16. You know what David's choice was, Lord, let me fall into your hands and not into the hands of men, for with you is mercy. It is sometimes a mercy to be immediately chastised by the hand of God our Father. God might turn us over to the hands of men. But if God will take us into his own hand and chastise with his own hand immediately, there is love in it. If a prince should say to his officers, My whole kingdom is before you, do right and execute justice and judgment. But as for such and such a family, if they shall commit any fault, I will chastise them immediately with my own hand. You shall not meddle with them. I will do it myself. Would this not argue love? Thus it is with the saints in the time of desertion. Then God takes the soul into his own hand. All creatures and officers of his anger stand and meddle not. In other affliction, God turns us over to his officers. But in desertion, there he corrects immediately. And therefore, though he strikes, yet there is love at the bottom. And the more Christ sympathizes with you in any affliction, the less cause you have to be discouraged. Crisis are sympathizing high priest in all our afflictions, but the more we are like to him in any affliction, the more he does sympathize, and his heart let out the more unto us. Jesus Christ was in desertion himself, and not only forsaken, but for our sakes under the wrath and displeasure of God his Father, 
and therefore when he sees a soul, not only deserted, but under anger and displeasure of God, then he says, oh, there is a soul that is in my case, and so he does most commiserate and compassionate that person. Have you then any reason to be discouraged in this respect? But this is not my case, for I am not only deserted, forsaken, under manifestations of Christ's displeasure, but I ascend and draw down this desertion upon my own soul. And therefore now it is that I am thus discouraged. And have I not reason for it? No, for God does not always desert and forsake his people for their sins. Sometimes he does, and sometimes he doesn't. As appears by comparing the third and fourth chapters of the Canicles. And it may be he does now withdraw from you, not for your sin. And if there be but a may be of it, there is no reason for discouragement. But suppose it be so. Look, I pray, into Isaiah 57 again, and see what the Lord has promised to a poor soul in this condition, verse 17. For the iniquity of his covetousness was I wroth, and smote him. I hid me and was wroth. And he went on frowardly in the way of his heart. Will you say, the Lord does not only hide his face from you, but he has smitten you? So here. Will you say, oh, but I have sinned and drawn this desertion upon myself? So it is here. For the iniquity of his covetousness I was wroth and smote him. Will you say, oh, but I have sinned on both sides of this desertion. I have sinned before the desertion came, which sin was a cause of it, and I have sinned since. I have been deserted by my frowardness and peevish carriage. So it was here. For the iniquity of his covetousness was I wroth and hid me. There is sin on the one side, and he went on frowardly in the way of his heart. There is sin on the other side of desertion. Here is sin on both sides. What then? Is there any hope or comfort or mercy for a heart in this condition? Yes, saith the Lord. I will restore comfort to him and to his mourners. Oh, but it is not comfort that my soul desires. But I have a foul, filthy, unclean, wicked heart of mine own. Oh, that my heart were healed. Is there any hope of healing mercy in this condition? Yes, saith the Lord in the text. I have seen his ways and will heal him. Oh, but though I be healed, I shall sin again and wander from God again. Nay, saith the Lord. But I have seen his ways and will heal him and will lead him also. But I see no means or likelihood of all this. How can it be? Yes, very well, for saith the Lord in verse 19. I create the fruit of the lips, peace, 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 to him that is afar off and I will heal him again. Oh, what comfort is here! What an upholding promise is here! Can you read it, or think of it, and your heart sink before it? This is but part of my condition, for I have sinned. Christ has forsaken me. I have sinned. Christ has smote me, and he goes on smiting, goes on angry, goes on displeased. I have been deserted a long while in the dark, a long while, and I am so far from the light that it does even grow darker and darker, my condition being more sad every day than any other. Every day I am deserted and my condition worse. Have I not reason to be cast down and discouraged now? No, for when was it worst with the Israelites? They had an ill time of it all the time they were in the land of Egypt a dark time. But was it not worse with them immediately before their deliverance? Did not the taskmasters then beat them? When was it worse with David? Was it not worse with him at Ziklag when he had lost his wives and his own men took up stones against him? Psalm 10. We read that David says, Why standest thou afar off, O Lord, and hide thyself in time of trouble? Hiding is more and worse than standing afar off. When the sun is going down, then it seems to be far off. But when it is hidden, then it is set and is further off. So says David, Lord, thou art not only afar off, but even out of sight, quite out of sight, and art hidden from me. His desertion grew higher and higher. 
And if you look into Psalm 13, you find that he speaks to the like purpose. How long will you hide your face from me? How long will you forget me, O Lord, forever? As hiding is more than standing afar off, so it is worse than forgetting. David should have said, Lord, you do not only restrain your love towards me, but you show tokens of your displeasure and anger, and your displeasure rises. So Psalm 22, verse 1, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I cry in the daytime, but you hear it not. Verse 2, How can this be, says Augustine, that God should forsake Christ in his sufferings, for these words are spoken of Christ, when God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself? Yes, very well, he says, for Christ as a common person stood in our stead and place. And so personating of us, he says, why have you forsaken me? Yea, and Lord, thou hast not only forsaken me, but my desertion rises yet higher. For I cry in the daytime, and you hear it not. But you may see this abundantly made out in Job 30, verse 20. I cry unto thee. And you do hear me. I stand up, and you regard me not. You are become cruel to me with your strong hand. You oppose yourself against me. Verse 27. My bowels boiled and don't rest. The days of affliction prevented me. I went mourning without the sun. I am a brother to dragons and a companion to owls. In verse 26. When I looked for good, then evil came to me. And when I waited for light, there came darkness. Thus you see that it may be the condition of God's own people to be worse and worse, and their condition more and more dark in their own apprehensions, and therefore no reason why you should be discouraged in this respect. But my desertions have been so long that I fear it will never be otherwise with me. God is now gone. Christ is now gone. Comfort is gone. And I fear now that Christ will never return again. And this is that which even sinks my soul. I confess the least desertion and forsaken is a great evil. But though I were under the greatest cloud in the world, I should bear it, if I did but think that Christ would return again. But I find in Scripture that there is a final rejection mentioned, as well as a present desertion. The saints and people of God are, it may be deserted for a time, but they are never rejected. David was deserted, but he was not rejected. Saul was rejected, finally rejected. And I fear that I am not only deserted for the present, but finally rejected. That God has cast me off forever, and therefore I am thus discouraged. Have I not cause and reason for it now? No, not yet. For first, it is usual with saints in affliction to think that God is gone, and will return no more. There is no affliction which the people of God meet with, and they meet with many, wherein they are so apt and prone and ready to write and never upon their condition, as in the case of spiritual desertion. If a godly, gracious man falls sick, he does not say presently or conclude, I shall never recover again. If he be persecuted by enemies, he does not conclude presently that he shall never be delivered. But if God hide his face at any time, then comes out this, never. I shall never be delivered. I shall never be restored to comfort again. So Psalm 13, how long will you hide your face? What? Forever? So Psalm 77, will the Lord cast off forever? Verse 7, will he be favorable no more? Is his mercy clean gone forever? And does his promise fail forevermore? This is a proper place and ground, where this unbelieving conclusion grows. When they are in this condition, they rise to a never. Oh, it will never be otherwise with me. Christ is gone, mercy is gone, and I shall never see the face of God again. This is usual, and most usual with the saints in this condition. Therefore you shall observe that when God gives out a promise to his children in this condition, the promise is so cast and laid as may most obviate and face this objection, and take off our never. Psalm 9, verse 18. The needy shall not always be forgotten. The expectation of the poor shall not fail forever. So Psalm 103. The Lord is merciful and gracious. 
Verse 8, slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. He will not always shy, neither will he keep his anger forever. So Isaiah 57, 16, for I will not contend forever, neither will I be always wroth. God sees that in this condition his people are apt to write and never upon their condition, and therefore that he may condescend unto their infirmities when he comes to give out a promise. He does not barely promise mercy, but he puts in the ever into his promise, that he may take off our unbelieving never. If it may be made out to you by scripture that God or Christ is not so gone, but that he will return again, then you will not say, Surely I have no reason for my discouragements. Now for the clearing of that, give me leave to propound several questions to you. First, did you ever read in all the word of God that a man was finally rejected and forsaken, but an evil spirit from the Lord did seize upon him presently? Saul was finally rejected, and the text says that an evil spirit from the Lord seized upon him. And what is the evil spirit but an envious spirit? The envious man in the gospel is the evil man. And this evil spirit seized on Saul as soon as God did forsake him, for an envious, malicious, persecuting spirit came upon him against David and the saints with him. So when God forsakes a man finally, a persecuting spirit enters him. When God forsakes his own children, Satan, that evil spirit, comes to them. For when God goes, Satan comes. But there is much difference between a tempting Satan and a persecuting Satan. Tempting Satan comes to the saints when they are deserted, but a persecuting Satan does not enter into them. But did you ever know or read of any finally rejected, but an evil persecuting spirit seized on them from the Lord? Number two. Do you read of any in all the word whom God did finally forsake that could not find in their hearts to forsake God and his ways? God does not forsake us unless we forsake him. You have rejected me, saith the Lord, and therefore I have rejected you. Possibly a good man may want this sense of God's love, but then he has a sense of his own sins. Possibly he may lack the feeling of his own perfection, which is divine love, but then he has the feeling of his own imperfection. But I say, did you ever read in all the word of any man finally forsaken that could not find in his heart to forsake God and the good ways of God? Number three, did you ever read in all the word that God did ever forsake a man who was sensible of his forsaking and complained of it simply for itself? We read of Saul, indeed, that when he was forsaken, he cried out and said, God has forsaken me, the Philistines are upon me. God has forsaken me, but it is in order to an outward evil. The Philistines are upon me. But the saints, when they are forsaken, are sensible of this evil simply for itself, and think the time long and tedious when they are so forsaken. O Lord, saith David, how long will you hide your face from me? What? Forever? But I say, was ever man forsaken? Was ever man quite forsaken of God that was sensible of this evil, only and simply for itself? Number four. Did you ever read in all the word of God that ever a man was finally forsaken, who was tender in the point of sin, who sat mourning after God? We read in the Romans that when God gave up the Gentiles to their sins, they gave up themselves unto all uncleanness and were past feeling. The saints and people of God, on the contrary, in a time of their desertion, are tender in the point of sin, and they mourn after God. When was a man ever forsaken whose heart was in this frame? Number five. Did you ever read that Christ did finally forsake a man in whose heart and soul? Still he did leave his goods, furniture, and spiritual household stuff? A man sometimes goes from his home, and sometimes he does quite leave his house. There's much difference between those two. If a man leave his house and comes no more, then he carries away all his goods. And when you see them carried away, you say, This man will come no more. But though a man ride a great journey, yet he may come again, and you say, Surely he will come again. Why? Because still his goods, his wife and children, are in his house. So if Christ reject a man and go away, finally he carries away all his goods, spiritual gifts, graces and principles, but though he be long absent, yet if his household stuff abide in the heart, 
if there be the same desires after him, and delight in him, and admiring of him, and mourning for lack of him, you may say, surely he will come again. Why? Because his household stuff is here still. When did Christ ever forsake a man in whose heart he left his spiritual furniture? Number six, did you ever know a man finally forsaken of Christ did long after the presence of Christ is the greatest good? And looked upon his absence as the greatest evil and affliction in all the world? Being willing to kiss the feet of Jesus Christ and to serve him in the lowest and meanest condition, so he might but enjoy him. We find that the saints desire, above all things, to be kissed with the kisses of Christ's mouth, and therefore the book of Canticles so begins in chapter 2, verse 1. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, even because that is the first and the chiefest of the saints' desires in this life. But if Christ will not kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, saith the gracious soul, yet I am willing to kiss his feet as Mary did. There is a time coming when he will kiss me with the kisses of his mouth forever. But for the present, if I can but kiss his feet here, I have hope to be kissed by him in heaven. Now I say, did Christ ever forsake a man finally, who did thus long after Christ himself? Can those that are forsaken mourn after his presence as a bad thing, and for his absence as the greatest evil in all the world? I appeal to your own souls and bosoms in this. Whoever you are that labor under this fear that Christ is gone and he will return no more, suppose that God has hid his face from you, seems to forget you and to be angry with you. Yet in the midst of all these darknesses, do you find an evil spirit, an envious malicious spirit from the Lord season upon you? Do you find that you can find in your heart to forsake God and the good ways of God? Yea, rather, do you not find a contrary Though you lack the sense of God's love, have you not the sense of your own sin? And when you lack the sense of your own perfection, have you not some sense of your own imperfection? Do you not look upon this desertion as the greatest affliction in all the world? Can you not mourn after God and his presence? And are you not willing to kiss the feet of Jesus Christ? Oh yes, I must needs say, though I have fears that Christ is gone and will return no more, yet I praise the Lord, I do not find an envious, malicious, persecuting spirit in my soul to the saints and people of God. I do not find that my heart is willing to forsake Christ and the good ways of Christ, but I find that I can mourn for the absence of Christ simply for itself and look upon it as the greatest affliction in the world that I am ever willing to kiss the feet of Jesus Christ, and to be in the lowest and meanest condition, so he would but return unto my soul again, then be of good comfort. Though Christ be absent, yet he will return again, and with great mercy and with everlasting kindness will he gather your souls to himself again. And thus I say it shall be with all the saints. Surely, therefore, they have no reason for their discouragements, whatever their desertions be. Why, therefore, should not every one say, Why aren't you cast down, O my soul? And why are you so disquieted within me? Upon all this account, I see I have not so much reason for my discouragement. But it is an hard thing to bear up one's heart from sinking in a time of desertion when God hides his face. What shall I do then? And this may be the condition of us all, that I may bear up my heart against this discouragement, even when I am most in the dark, and Christ hides his face from me, or forsakes me. Well, take heed that you do not measure God's eternal affection by some present dispensation. There is an eternal displeasure against a man, and there is a present displeasure with a man. Eternal displeasure, or hatred, cannot stand with eternal love. But eternal love and present displeasure may stand together. A father may be displeased with the child for the present, and yet may love him with paternal love. So God may and does love, though for the present displeased. But when men measure eternal affection by present dispensation, then they are quite discouraged. And you will find all discouragements in this case arise from this. Some there are that do walk by particular providences, experiences, words, manifestations, and incomes of love. And when they have them, then they are much refreshed, and if they lack them, then they are much discouraged and say, Ah, Christ doesn't love me, and God is gone. Will return 
no more. Why? Because they measure God's eternal love by some present dispensation. But if God's present dispensations may seem to run cross to his eternal purpose, why then should they be discouraged and say he is gone forever? Now so it is, he may hide his face, he may withdraw and deny particular comforts and manifestations, yet love me eternally. Oh, that God's people would not measure God's eternal affection by some present dispensation, so should they never be much discouraged. If you would not be discouraged in this condition, take heed of letting fall any despairing, despondent, unbelieving speeches. For the more busy Satan is about you in a time of desertion, the more tedious will that time be and more full of discouragements. Now look, as it is with some dog, if you let fall a bone or bread or meat, the dog stays and waits still. But when he finds none, he goes his way. So it is with Satan. When a man is in desertion, he comes and he says, This is a time for me to work. who am the firstborn child of darkness. And this soul being in the dark, it is a fit time for me to work upon him. There he stands. And if any despairing, despondent speeches do fall from you, Satan stays the longer. But if none fall, he goes away the sooner. Have you therefore been, or are you under any desertion, and let fall any bones for Satan? Look back, and gather them all up again. Gather up these crumbs again, and mourn over them, and take heed for the time to come. For the more of these fall, the longer Satan stays, and the more you will be discouraged. A lifting up of the downcast by William Bridge.